Good morning, everyone. Uh, I apologize for not being able to be with you in person. Uh, I want to uh, extend a, a heartfelt thank you for coming out to today's CARES conference. Um, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to discuss uh, individualizing surgical glaucoma management. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, noting that I have no uh, disclosures to report. I'd like to start off by talking about um, how surgical glaucoma management is such an individualized process. Um, as uh, you'll see later on in the presentation, this is not a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, approach. And so individualizing surgical treatment for glaucoma really begins by assessing one's risks and the rate at which their glaucoma might be perceived to be progressing. This is a slide many of you in the audience might have had uh, the pleasure to see Dr. Spath present, uh, but this is a, 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 a diagram that he has developed, which really I think illustrates how assessing one's risks for progression really is a determination based on the rate at which people are perceived to be changing. If people have very early disease and it seems to be very slowly progressive, then it is very likely that they will outlive their disease. However, if people have a greater rate at which progression is perceived and one that is more rapid than perceived lifespan, that is where really intervention is going to be paramount to help slowing down the process. And indeed, intraocular pressure lowering, as many of you already know, is one of the most primary um, modifiable risk factors for glaucoma. And there is ample evidence uh, in very well-designed trials to demonstrate the impact of pressure lowering in glaucoma. And I think as a rule of thumb from these studies, we can gather two things. One, pressure lowering is very, very important in terms of slowing down glaucoma. And two, the extent of pressure lowering is often established by the stage of one's disease. In other words, early disease might not require as much pressure lowering as moderate to advanced disease to achieve slower rates of progression. And today we really are at a watershed moment in terms of surgical decision making for glaucoma. We have many surgical options to offer patients and it is not a one-size-fits-all phenomenon. So if we look at folks in the early to moderate to advanced categories, we find that there are different treatment options for each of that, those categories. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about each of those categories. On the left-hand side of the screen, you could see an optic nerve, and that is a pretty healthy-looking optic nerve. Uh, and so in the earlier scale of things, uh, facal emulsification, which is cataract surgery, or something I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, may be options. As we advance along in the spectrum to moderate to advanced glaucoma, we see that what we call filtering surgery starts to become the primary modality for surgical pressure lowering. If we look at a diagram on where the surgical sites we're talking about are, here you can see a diagram of the front of the eye. And just to review, we see that there is fluid made by the ciliary muscle, and it has to traverse into the front part of the eye called the anterior chamber. It then exits through the canal of Schlem, and, and that balances how people develop a normal intraocular pressure. In many cases, when there is resistance at the level of the drains, that's where pressure builds up and causes potentially optic nerve damage. And so when we talk about the different locations for management, Cataract surgery has been shown to lower eye pressure, and stenting procedures that I'll talk about all are working on essentially the outflow of the drainage system. Now, when we look at the, the right-hand side of the screen, bypass procedures, trabeculectomy, tube shunts, and some of the newer technologies for stenting in a certain potential space between uh, the wall of the eye and the eye muscle, these work on really essentially bypassing the natural outflow pathways. So for mild uh, disease, mild glaucoma, um, I want to spend a, a minute or two talking about cataract surgery and cataract surgery plus what we call minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. It's been pretty clearly well established that 
in when people undergo cataract extraction that there might be a modest reduction in their intraocular pressure. And this has been shown both in patients who have not had a pre-existing history of glaucoma and in people who have early to mild, moderate glaucoma, folks who undergo cataract surgery do experience a sustained intraocular pressure lowering, modest uh, by a few points. And if we follow this effect out over three years in one very well-designed study, we see that that effect uh, seems to persist. So I guess the take-home message is, is that in eyes with pretty reasonably well-controlled intraocular pressure uh, with or without medicines or little or mild glaucoma damage, that cataract surgery alone can reduce intraocular pressure sustainably by modest amounts. That brings me to minimum invasive glaucoma surgery. This is a... Uh, a newer sort of modality, at least in the last several years, FDA approved, um, and there are some newer devices that are down the pike, not yet FDA approved, that you might hear your glaucoma surgeon talk to you about, but this is also relegated to mild to moderate disease, and this is typically performed in conjunction with the cataract being removed. One of the advantages of this type of procedure is that because it's done through a small incision, um, that it does not use up some of the areas that may be required later on in surgical management, uh, like a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt around the outside of the eye. Some of the downsides with minimum invasive glaucoma surgery are that it is unclear, based on a lot of the studies we have now, how much work is the device by itself doing, because it is often performed in conjunction with cataract surgery, so we do see a pressure-lowering effect with cataract surgery. But we do see a greater reduction in the number of meds when these stents are added to cataract surgery. One of the other downsides is this, again, to underscore, is not something that we see very substantial pressure lowering. You might remember from my earlier slide that folks with moderate to advanced disease really need much, much, much lower intraocular pressures. And these minimally invasive procedures, although can modestly lower eye pressure, it is not going to create a very substantial reduction in intraocular pressure or med burden for those with later stage disease. These procedures are performed in a way called ab interno, which means um, within the actual uh, anterior segment of the eye. Um, it is not bypassing it to an, a different uh, space externally. Um, and so I'll talk about a few different stents. Uh, there is the trabecular micro bypass called the eye stent, and there are some uh, stents that are actually cannulized into the canal of Schlem. And then furthermore, there are some stents that uh, will create a, a small little space between the eye muscle and the wall of the eye to help lower eye pressure. The first stent I want to talk about is the trabecular micro bypass stent. This is um, uh, called the eye stent. And um, the uh, uh, head of our department, Dr. Jay Katz, uh, uh, was instrumental in some of these uh, uh, early trials with this stent. And this uh, is a, the smallest stent implanted in the human body. This is implanted uh, in to the trabecular meshwork to help bypass some of the resistance that's occurring at that level so that fluid can go back through the normal physiologic pathways into some of the pathways beyond that called the collector channels. And what was shown is essentially that uh, when cataract surgery was performed in conjunction with the eye stent, that there was a greater reduction in the number of medicines that were required after surgery. Moving on to other types of stents, um, the top of the screen you could see is what's called the hydrus. This is what we call an intracanalicular stent, which is basically uh, dilating the canal of Schlem for a few clock hours with the idea that by stenting it open, that you're able to also create enhanced outflow uh, through the canal of Schlem. Now, the data for this is still pending. This is not FDA approved, but we are seeing some promising results in early studies. The bottom part of the screen is called the side pass, and this is basically creating a small little uh, bypass to the space between the eye muscle and the wall of the eye to help lower eye pressure that way. This is often performed in conjunction with cataract surgery as well. Again, uh, we have seen some early promising uh, results with this type of device, um, however, not FDA approved as of yet. But what's interesting to note is that the promising data from minimally invasive glaucoma surgery has led to uh, a lot of uh, emphasis in terms of 
potentially lowering pressure with these micro devices um, that may leave open options down the road if one's level of glaucoma were to change and require uh, some of the more traditional types of procedures. So we're very excited to have those types of technologies, uh, some of which are available immediately, some of which are down the pike. Um, but that being said, I want to just briefly touch on the tried and true of surgical management in glaucoma. Um, you know, there is a lot of moderate to advanced disease out there, and so therefore, uh, procedures that have a, a storied track record um, that have continued to increase in their safety based on modifications in terms of surgical techniques um, include the trabeculectomy and various tube shunt procedures. Now, these are bypass types of procedures. Um, these are procedures that take the fluid from inside the eye and bypass them to a space externally uh, right outside the wall of the eye, which then is absorbed by the blood vessels behind the eyeball and recirculates. That's how the, these uh, uh, types of procedures function. Um, a trabeculectomy, um, very, very extensive um, study. There are many, many studies on trabeculectomy in the literature, greater than 5,000 and greater than 1,000 on tube shunts. Um, as I say before, people who require very low intraocular pressures, um, these are the types of procedures that can help achieve those intraocular pressures. Um, over the years, techniques have been modified to enhance the safety of these procedures, and there's a pretty well-established list of, of pros and cons to these procedures, both short and long term. With trabeculectomy, what we're really doing is creating a bypass pathway. We create a little flap in the wall of the eye, and that allows fluid to bypass the eye's uh, internal pathways and uh, externalize underneath the outer lining of the eye. And it forms a, a subtle elevation above um, uh, the wall of the eye called a filtration bleb here. You can see a very uh, subtle elevation uh, up top uh, underneath the eyelid. Not visible in casual conversation in most patients. Um, Next, we have what's called a tube shunt, which is generally a synthetic device that's attached to the wall of the eye, and this tube is then inserted uh, typically in the front chamber of the eye to help do the same thing, which is bypassing fluid. And there are pros and cons to both trabeculectomy and tube shunt that, again, going back to the individualized surgical process, might be better suited for one patient versus another. Here you can see a little picture of, uh, of a tube shunt uh, in the front chamber of the eye uh, that is uh, accessing the fluid and draining it to the, the space uh, outside the eye. In summary, surgical planning for glaucoma is highly individualized. One size does not fit all. Uh, one procedure is not the right procedure for every person. Um, I did not mention a few other procedures. Um, but there are values in other procedures that were just not mentioned as a part of this talk, uh, that were beyond the scope of this talk, um, and that your, your physician might, might explore with you um, based on your, your specific circumstance. And we're very excited to have a growing armamentarium in surgical management uh, for glaucoma uh, that offers patients more uh, individualized options based on their stage of disease. Um, and in a process that we often manage for life, it is nice to have a, a stepwise approach that leaves open options down the road. Going back to risk assessment, um, one can see that if we look at uh, people who require more lower pressure, greater uh, pressure lowering, for example, advanced uh, glaucoma or perhaps low tension glaucoma, um, and people who may not require as much intraocular pressure lowering, we can see we can individualize those surgical modalities, whether it's cataract surgery alone, cataract surgery plus a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, or perhaps bypass procedures, filtration surgery, trabeculectomy, tube shunts, as I uh, discussed. Um, so we're very excited uh, to have these technologies. Um, I want to thank everyone in the audience for taking the time out of their personal schedules to uh, um, come to this day. Uh, for the CARES conference. Again, my apologies for not being present in person, uh, but a heartfelt thank you to uh, everyone in attendance. Um, and if anyone has any questions directly, I can certainly be reached uh, uh, at Wills Eye Hospital. Thanks very much.